Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harrison Walker. Join us each week as we follow our curiosity, diving deep into the familiar and the foreign. Reach beyond your front door as we uncover new perspectives, explore intriguing ideas, and have real conversations with the best guests. Ready for something different? Let's get started. On June 27th, the world's smallest handbag made a big splash in international headlines. Known as the Microscopic Handbag, it was created by Mischief, an American art collective based in Brooklyn, New York, and sold via Jupiter, the online auction house founded by Farrell Williams. Some extraordinary handbags have sold for exorbitant amounts of money, but in the case of this tiny handbag, the final sold price was, well, large, at $63,750 U.S. dollars. The microscopic handbag is a miniature purse made of fluorescent green photopolymer resin designed to look like a translucent Louis Vuitton's on-the-go tote with signature monogram and all. But unlike the original, this miniature version was 657 by 222 by 700 micrometers. As described by Mischief, smaller than a grain of sea salt and narrow enough to pass through the eye of a needle, this is a purse so small you'll need a microscope to see it. This wee little accessory even came with its own microscope, which allowed for better viewing of the purse on a digital display. Kevin Weissner, the chief creative officer for Mischief, stated, As a once functional object, like a handbag, becomes smaller and smaller, its object status becomes steadily more abstracted until it's purely a brand signifier. It is interesting to note, however, that although Mischief had created a miniature replica of the Louis Vuitton bag, the creation was crafted without the iconic brand's permission. Fashion is always pushing the boundaries, but this... I know, right? I wonder who purchased it, because it really has no practical function, does it? None, just status, but I'm sure someone bought it just to possess it. It would be so easy to accidentally misplace. I know. It wouldn't survive a day in my house, honestly. (laughs) No, not in mine either. I think before you can really grasp how tiny this purse is, you have to see the photos of it propped up on a fingertip. But at that price, you would keep a very close eye on it. Yeah, I guess so. But really, you can't even put your auction receipt inside. No, it's like an itty bitty plastic purse model, even smaller than a Barbie purse. I don't get it, Harris. I don't either. But frankly, fashion can sometimes be a bit difficult to understand, can't it? So true. Mm -hmm. I mean, what exactly is fashion and what is the purpose of fashion? According to Wikipedia's quite lengthy definition, fashion is a term used interchangeably to describe the creation of clothing, footwear, accessories, cosmetics, and jewelry of different cultural aesthetics and their mix and match into outfits that depict distinctive ways of dressing as signifiers of social status, self-expression, and group belonging. I think this definition, though, is missing the idea that fashion is also like art. It could be viewed as a creative medium, no? Well, I think the answer to that might depend on who you ask. Yeah, you're right. For example, the late Bill Cunningham, an American fashion photographer for the New York Times, said, fashion is the armor to survive the reality of everyday life. And the iconic Vivian Westwood, she said, fashion is very important. It is life-enhancing, and like everything that gives pleasure, it is worth doing well. I love her. Me too. When I was in high school, I was always super excited to receive my monthly issue of Vogue in the mail. The fall issue in particular was like a small telephone book. It was huge. It brought me a whole lot of pleasure. Wow, you were a fashionista <laughs> even then, Walker. Well, I would say that I was curious about fashion, but it was very apparent that the designs in those pages were certainly out of the budget of the typical high school girl. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, so I quickly learned that developing my own sense of style was much more affordable than following expensive fashion trends. I have to admit, though, I was very taken with Ralph Lauren and the style he popularized in the 80s. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty good stuff. He certainly did rise to incredible heights. Oh, he did. He's known for saying, I don't design clothes, I design dreams. Ooh. But now, I'm a bit too tired, lazy, and frugal to follow trends anymore. Yeah, you and me both. I think a lot of people are a bit foggy on the difference, though, between fashion and style. And there is a difference. Okay, tell me about it. Well, Heidi Carey, an accessory designer who began her career as an accessory designer for Ralph Lauren and Vera Wang, said that the terms are often used interchangeably, but that it's important to know the difference. 
She says that when something starts trending, it soon becomes fashion. It gets molded into something for the masses to buy and adapt, stripping them of their uniqueness. And when you look fashionable, it's much more about the clothes than the person who's wearing them. Style, on the other hand, is a way of expressing ourselves. And as she says, taking how we feel on the inside and showing it on the outside, finding that confidence to be our best selves. Mm. She notes that style can be reflected through the way you dress, decorate your house, how you speak, or even write. She claims that true style doesn't date and it's worth investing in. It evolves with you. I'm down with finding our own style. It not only sounds more affordable than fiendishly following the latest fashion, But it also sounds like it could be better for the environment as well. Yes, Heidi Carey has issues with fashion because the magazines focus on trends rather than style. This has a greater negative impact on the environment. She says that more than anything, fashion is a business. It is about consumerism, but without much thought to the consumers as individuals. Our next guest is an advocate for sustainable fashion. We are really excited to introduce Lucy Siegel. Lucy is a British broadcaster, author, and journalist specializing in climate and sustainability. Her book, To Die For, is Fashion Wearing Out the World, was nominated for the 2012 Orwell Prize and formed the basis of the documentary, The True Cost, which Lucy co-produced. Lucy is also the co-founder of the Green Carpet Challenge with Livia Firth, a sustainability initiative that puts sustainable fashion in the spotlight on red carpets around the world. Welcome to At Home and Abroad, Lucy. Oh, thank you. It's such a pleasure to speak to you. So I want to start with you. Where does this incredible drive to amplify sustainability come from? Well, I think I had quite a close connection with the natural world when I was a young child. So I grew up in a sort of suburban environment and but my grandfather was a very keen amateur ecologist even though he worked oh. for an oil company in an oil refinery and he always told me that they thought the oil was going to run out so that there would be peak oil and they were planning for a time when we would have different technologies and different industries. So I kind of grew up a bit with that mindset because I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and I like bird watching and stuff like that. And then, of course, you know, life takes over and I went off and did all sorts of, you know, exciting what I thought were exciting things, got really into fast fashion. I was consuming a lot. I used to live to go out clubbing, which is great. There's nothing. And actually from the rave movement, a lot of the eco movement started, which is cool. Right. Um, and then I just kind of found that I felt very divorced from the natural world and what was going on. And it's one of those things when you return to look at landscapes that you may be left when you were younger and they're not there. You yeah. notice the absence and I started to notice the absence and the excess. I had too much stuff. I didn't know where it was all from. And I started to make some inquiries and the story was just really dramatic. And I couldn't believe that nobody was talking about how much oil went into producing clothing, for example, um, which I started to really look at around the mid noughties, 2004, 2005. And that sort of married with my interest in weird stuff like organic farming, which is now quite mainstream. So It is, isn't it? I've happily been sitting here waiting for some company, and now I've got quite a lot of company. So, <laughs> Which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's lovely. Your book, To Die For, has been instrumental in highlighting the harm that fast fashion inflicts on the environment, as you say, and also on garment industry workers. Do you think that since you've sort of expose this issue to the world that the fashion industry has responded positively? Have there been positive changes in your mind? There's been lots of positive changes, but not from the fashion industry necessarily. So um, the positive energy and the positive change comes from different generations, comes from different ways of doing things, and comes from, broadly speaking, people who are prepared to break the system The disappointment has been that people who are controlling the system and in the system are not prepared to break the mold sufficiently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They want to make little tweaks, which give them competitive advantage with which they are obsessed and increase market share, which they've done through marketing and greenwash, but they're not really into breaking the system. And what I found very early on, and this is not just my assessment, this was by applying data and looking at evidence, was that the system is not working. 
or it only works for the advantage of very few people. So mm-hmm. if you look at the 1% argument that you take, that you, that you use in a lot of industrialized economy and you say, this is grossly unfair, you know, 1% of, you know, billionaires or whatever. And everyone else, you know, everyone else is sort of broadly struggling. You know, it, I think, the, I think the fashion industry is really indicative of that. Okay. And for me, that's really symptomatic of a system that is failing most people. Mm-hmm. And that's what fashion is. It's a system that's failing most people. That's so interesting. And do you think it is the people who are in control or the organizations who are in control, do you think that they are failing to respond to these calls for being more environmentally sensitive because of the almighty dollar? Is it all about profit? Yes, largely it's all about profit. But then there's also there's there's being in control and there's trying to be in control of chaos, which is also happening So sometimes when people get promoted to these very elevated positions and they always have these kind of really fancy job titles, I just feel really sorry for them. Yeah. Because I think, you know, it's like being in a runaway car. Unless you're going to jump out at the traffic stop, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Yeah. (laughs) Ultimately, ultimately you're still going to be in charge of a runaway vehicle. And the more responsibility you take on, the more of the driver you are, the more responsibility that you're going to get hit with somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, ultimately, we just want to help. We just want to sort the mess out and we want to make it more worthy of the love and support that many many people instinctively give to the fashion industry. You know, I don't like calling people consumers because we're we're citizens with agency. But, you know, if I was if I was to say fashion consumers or fashion lovers, supporters, whatever, they do give a lot to the industry. They're very, very loyal, a bit like they can be to Mm -hmm. celebrities. And you don't like to see people treated being treated badly. You know. Exactly. Or hoodwinked in any kind of way. Exactly. Yeah. Which is yeah. a form of bad treatment, you know. It certainly is. You know, in an ideal world, what could leaders of the fashion industry do to stop that runaway car or at least slow it down? Well, the first thing that they could do is acknowledge that people who work in the garment industry need to be paid a living wage. Absolutely. And they can make that happen. Mm-hmm. So you have people, and again, this is where I feel bad for them. Like people in these elevated positions coming out and having to justify occasionally, not all the time, but sometimes having to justify why there is this huge discrepancy between what garment workers get paid and what they get paid (laughs) or the profits, the profits that are all siphoned one way. So there has at various times, there's a couple of things going on here. It's not just that garment workers don't get paid enough. It's that they are um, victims of systemic wage theft. Okay. Can you expand on that? Garment workers are not just paid lowly, but they are actually robbed of their wages. And there's a lot of research to back this up, research from places like New York Stern, um, EU Parliament. I mean, there's, you know, countless, countless studies to show that this is the case. Um, So they do a lot of overtime, which they are not paid for. And If you go back to To Die For, which was published back in 2010, 2011, a lot of that was based on the work of a few people, but based on uh, Neil Carney, who was a trade union activist in the UK, and actually went and measured the factory procedures that garment workers were working under and found massive discrepancies. So broadly speaking, a buyer could go in and they could place an order for a million pairs of something. I think we used city shorts, which was a thing back in 2011. Okay. You know, those kind of like shorts that you would wear to a meeting with a jacket. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. It, it was yep. a thing. It was a, it was a thing. Yeah. So, so, so a buyer would go and place an order for a million pairs of these and they would base it on old arithmetic, which basically said we can produce X pairs every half hour, every 30 mm-hmm. minutes. What that didn't allow for was machinery breaks, uh, drops, dropouts in power, because a lot of factories, and this is still the case in textile producing hotspots like Bangladesh, have their own generators. They have intermittent power. Um, some things are evening out, but it didn't really take a, take note of their circumstances. So in effect, it was like um, a piece of fiction, this contract, and they could not meet these deadlines. However, if they didn't meet the deadlines, then the factory runs into penalties, which are financial penalties. 
Um, so they will lock the workers in to make sure that they get this completed. So they're always running at a deficit. So garment workers, by and large, were being set up to fail. And that is where a lot of the problems stem from. They're being locked in, the wage theft, the very cheap prices of the clothing, which the fast fashion industry in particular is at pains to suggest has nothing to do with the final price, has nothing to do with, with workers' wages. And there's all of these intricacies And the contracts are largely written in the favor of these huge multinational companies. So you have to worry Mm -hmm. for the, you know, the factory owners sometimes as well, you know. So the whole thing is predicated or built on exploitation of somebody at some Mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, often, you know, if you campaign against these things, you're cast as a sort of Pollyanna figure who just wants everything to be lovely and, you know. You know, we're not, we're not like unrealistic. What we're saying is you shouldn't be stealing people's wages from them because you can. And often you can because these are young women. Often, you know, historically they were brought in from rural regions. So they were quite um, naive to the workings of these operations, didn't necessarily have family to tell them what, you know, what it was like and stuff like that. And once they became more savvy and tried to assert their rights, they were let go, or sometimes they were intimidated. Sometimes they were subjected to violence, which is very, very common. Um, and things, and we see things like forced abortions. Um, you know, not, it's not just a lack of healthcare. It's like veering over into the real kind of dark side abuse. of abuse. Yep. Exactly, abuse. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've, we had an umbrella term for this type of abuse, which is sweatshop labor. Right. And then you sometimes have people saying, well, there's no sweatshops. You know, there's, there, there is no legal definition of a sweatshop. But if you go back into Victorian literature, especially around the UK, where Charles Dickens wrote mm-hmm. about such things, mm-hmm. although it only was actually Dickens that coined the term, a sweatshop is really where you have a middleman who is using force of some sort of power to almost stand over a vulnerable worker. Right. And that really is the definition of sweatshop labor. So I think that a lot of these practices tick that box. Um, and that, and that's the reality of mm-hmm. being in the garment industry at, at this time and has been historically as well. So I think we've gone through periods when we think, oh, we've, we've sorted this. Um, and then you, you have to examine the flip side. So what does good, what would a good garment experience look like? Right. It would look like having a decent wage, a living wage, which means that you can cover your costs, that you can put something aside. And certainly during COVID, when a lot of, um, uh, garment or, or brands cancelled their orders, we saw again that workers don't have they had no Pensions safety net. Savings. There's no safety net yeah. at all. And then you think, well, grocery stores stop their credit after two or three days, and then you can get into real starvation situations, which is why in the event of a catastrophe like Rana Plaza, you will see agencies dropping food parcels quite quickly because this is the situation that we are in. Um, what else would it look like? Well, it might look like you don't have somebody standing over you, like, you know, mm-hmm. literally, or you're not being watched because you can do that remotely through cameras now as well. It might be that you don't just do one seam, but you have the knowledge and the training to sew a whole garment because right. that's empowering and it means that you can take your skills elsewhere. Mm -hmm. disempowering is not to know the full process yeah so these are all elements of what dignified work looks like and within that there is some there is some provision for people enjoying what they do and that's when they get told that's ridiculous you're being pollyannaish and it's like why but there's a payoff for an employer if people enjoy what they do. Exactly. Right? Exactly. There's a there's an improvement in quality of work and output and you know, efficiency. There are yeah. payoffs there. And it seems to me that these large multinational corporations have room to make this a reality in in their financial picture. Yes. And also if it was properly embedded as part of ESG, like, you know, if you can only get capital funding or that flow is flow of money is only facilitated if you address these issues, mm-hmm. it would be done tomorrow. Right. You know, it yeah. would be done tomorrow. And the only reason that it isn't being done, and I've heard every excuse, you know, I've heard big fashion brands say, we can't pay workers more in Bangladesh because then they'll be 
earning the same as a policeman. And as someone in the audience said, so what? I mean, maybe sewing a garment is the same as being a policeman. And why is yeah. that up to you? And this that was a this was a, a brand that likes to cast itself as very um, forward thinking. Mm. So forward thinking. So, I mean, we have to look at these issues. And the reason I'm saying this and people might be like, well, I thought you said you're an environmentalist. This has got nothing to do with the environment is because unless you have social sustainability, you don't have environmental sustainability. We know that. Yeah. Anyway, there's a there's a really kind of interesting movement within um, campaigners, which is a broad church. It's not just people out with placards who like Greta Thunberg. You know, this is people who have studied this, are expert, expert, like PhD expert in workers' rights, in textiles, in materials, um, and sustainability. You know, they're thought leaders, they're policy makers, and they look at this and they think, you know, if we actually paid people a living wage or mandated, which is, by the way, enshrined in law. So the first agreement is basically all predicated on um, living wage. And, and it asserts that living wage is a human right. Mm-hmm. And we've done a piece of work here in the UK, although globally, where we took evidence from 13 different countries and lawyers working in those countries. And that was brought together by Jessica Simon QC, who is um, a lawyer here in the UK for The Circle, which is an NGO, where she has categorically proved that living wage is a human right. So brands who are not paying living wage, and very few of them are, are, um, are breaking human rights law. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or in contravention, as you say. Yeah, so that that is... To me, that's like being on the wrong side of history. Yes. And I think, you know, what the work that you're doing is so critically important because it puts this issue on and also keeps this issue on the public stage. Because I think when your work was first released, it was a flashpoint. Everybody was, you know, very, very in tune with it. And you know, people were trying to reuse and recycle. And then the multinationals came in and gave their little song and dance. And I think a lot of people may have thought, oh, well, it's been addressed. Of course, they were doing the wrong yeah. thing. Now they've changed it. But yeah. in actual fact, that's not the case. It's it's not really the case. And, mm-hmm. you know, you have to go back to basics. And I, here I have learned a lot from people like Greta Thunberg, because you know, if you listen to Greta's climate messaging early on, it was just back to basics. It was asserting mm-hmm. and reasserting the fundamentals, which I think some of that's on us because, you know, as you you assert these messages and then you too develop and move on, you don't want to be saying the same thing every day for my yeah. entire life. Yeah. You think, mm-hmm. I want to say something fresh. I want to say something new. And then you forget that you're in a sense losing your audience and there's new there's a new generation who have a different perspective and in a sense what really happened was that brands and fashion in general are very very good and very organized at getting to young people very quickly yes. and I don't think there was a comparator there necessarily we didn't have the funds education certainly where I live in the UK on textiles has sort of vanished out of schools you know yeah. so people weren't learning to do the craft skills the sewing the knitting the putting right. together and then a lot of people went to college I just wanted to be designers they wanted to be big name designers and you know we had heads of fashion colleges saying nobody knows how to cut a pattern yeah I know those and it's true the back to basics is really critically important mm. we're seeing a little bit of that yeah I think definitely. here and perhaps in the in the UK as well, uh, trying to instill those skills in our young people as they're coming up. And I think they're embracing it, uh, but uh, there's still some way to go. It's very exciting because I actually have a much wider brief. So I look at climate and nature stories, you know, across society. So I don't just look at fashion and textiles. And if I look at the way that wind turbines are now being made from a very like high tensile fabric, essentially these huge, huge offshore turbines, which are going to power the green economy and the the green revolution, whatever, they are being cut by hand in a real craft process. No, because that's the best way to do them. That's incredible. It is incredible. So we are starting to see skills um for which you need humans 
Yes, which is an important point. <laughs> yes, because people need jobs. Yeah. Um, and people need to be invested in what they're making to a degree mm-hmm. because otherwise, you know, we just get into that. We'll never get away from the linear take, make and waste economy. People value stuff much more if they've had a hand in making it. Let me tell mm-hmm. I, I know that from myself. Yes. And yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a sort of like quiet revolution in a sense where a lot of these practical skills are kind of coming together to facilitate all sorts of elements of a just transition. And if you think about how that could play, you know, my friend and colleague, Safia Mini, who's a great um, uh, sustainable fashion campaigner and had her own brand for many, many years, you know, she's very close to people who work the looms in Bangladesh, for example. And one of her projects was the first ever project to get organic cotton grown in India in a fair trade project onto hand looms in Bangladesh, which were operated by women because for years, women were not allowed those jobs because they paid more. They were considered too skilled for women. Um, So she kind of broke that mold. And if you look at just the, the carbon sequestration involved in that process it is phenomenal like how low carbon that is compared Mm -hmm. to these huge mills and these industrial mills and especially now they're using polyester blends which are Mm oil-based you know fossil fuels like consider the the comparative carbon footprints but consider the social footprints how many people are employed you know whole families are financed by one person who has the skills to work those looms so this is the kind of thing that we trade off and we think about all the time when we think of making fashion in a sustainable system versus a non-sustainable system and the opportunities the potential they it's huge yeah it's limitless yes it's limitless once we start wrapping our our minds around it and start taking action it's really limitless yeah and it's not about everyone deserves to have the same consumer goods like you know i'm not i'm not like campaigning so that people get i don't know playstations or xbox or satellite tv I am trying to get them the conditions so that they can literally stay in the game of human life. Yes. But within that, we can also provide just such an incredible ripple effect mm-hmm. if you get it right. And that and that is really the great sort of prize of a sustainable fashion system is almost the social component, really. So, Lucy, we mentioned the Green Carpet Challenge. Can you tell us what the origins of this initiative are or were, I should say? Yeah. So, I've been working with my friend Olivia Fur for many, many years, and I laugh because it's so long ago. She contacted me because she originally, she had a shop selling, you know, environmentally friendly, low-impact goods. I mean, it was really ahead of its time. And... Part of that, you know, part of that, we would she would sell clothing and she would host sustainable designers in a sort of pop up shop format and all of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, she looks great, and she was like, "Oh, maybe I'll wear this. Maybe I'll wear this." Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, she was married to the actor Colin Firth, and he was nominated for a load of um, films to 2010, 2011. I mean, he's always nominated for films. He's such a brilliant <laughs> he actor. Is. But this, the, you know, he was nominated for the Oscars and stuff like that. And then, you know, Olivia said to me, I've got to do all these red carpets. Like, you know, there's because it's not just the Oscars, it's the SAG Awards and the Golden Globe. So there's all that machine. Yes. And she was like, oh, God, I hate doing all that horrible <laughs> fashion stuff. It's so soulless. <laughs> and I said, well, to keep yourself interested, why don't you just commit to doing it all sustainably? And then as you go along, you're so great at like working with designers and telling their stories. Mm-hmm. Why don't you give them the opportunity so we started with a number of designers and again I'm laughing because they've become such good friends over the years and we they you know they were doing kind of amazing work like growing indigo in their backyards to dye you know blacks 
that, that a farmer had produced, you know, and and we were like this global network and we were like, what have you got? What fabrics have you got? Like literally like that. Can you cut it into this? Like would it make a, you know, a sort of red carpet dress? And we were trying out all these fantastic things. Some of them didn't work and some of them did. But Livia, Livia has such a great spirit. I would have sooner died than wear some of the things that she wore. <laughs> It's so exposing. Yeah, yeah. And she like pulls it off with such great aplomb, and she was able to explain what we were sort of doing. And then, I mean, we had a sort of hemp bustier that sort of grew as the night went on. So she was like literally holding it to her. And then she had a, a repurposed wedding dress. I think that was the first ever one that we did. And none of, you know, people who stand, the reporters who stand by the side, which I myself have done many times. What are you wearing? What are you wearing? They were just so confused why anybody would be in an old wedding dress. <laughs> And they were like, that was a challenge for them to figure that out. They had no, and they were like, oh. were, I remember one of them saying, have a nice wedding. As she oh, walked no. Off and like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so we, we had to keep refining our messaging and, you know, just kind of trying to understand. And we ended up putting together sort of protocols to help designers because what we found with designers was that they were really up for the challenge because designers actually love constraints. So if you give them rules, they're happy. Because otherwise, it's like it's a bit lawless out there, and they're very solutions focused. So they, if you give them the problem, they'll go, "Ah, I see. Right. So let's try this. Try this. Try this." And then the project evolved. Anna Winter really liked it. Um, she loves Livia, and she was she just again admired that spirit. And she was like, "I tell you what, we'll do is let's get some you know, real like top design talent." looking at this and then we did a met ball with Cameron Diaz wearing Stella McCartney two green carpet challenge protocols mm -hmm. and yeah it just all went wow it, yeah, went it just up. grew from there yeah. it grew from there and then you know it but but we always wanted to work very deep in the supply chain so um we didn't just want to dress people for the red carpet for like one season it was really a way of storytelling this different system of fashion. Mm. And now Livia started a company called EcoAge, which is now huge all over the world. They also have a policy division, policy and advocacy division with a guy called George Harding Rolls, who's fabulous. And, you know, they're really, really deep in the warp and the weft of fashion. There you go. That's nice, isn't it? So, and, <laughs> and the Green Carpet Challenge is um, sort of evolved into something called the Green Carpet Fashion Awards. And then Natural Home is in LA. So I was lucky enough to go to those last year. And, you know, it was incredible. We had Leonardo DiCaprio on stage with Sonia Guajajara, who is Brazil's first ever Indigenous Communities Minister. And it was beautiful. But you're as likely to hear us talking about avoiding deforestation as you are what fibre, you know, someone's shoes right. are made from. Because for us, it all ties in together and, you know, we work a lot with young activists. So one of the things that we often do is host dinners with really leading thought leaders who are, you know, invariably under 30 <laughs> and invariably Indigenous backgrounds Okay, who just have um, a very, very clear connection with the work and those are the people that I feel happiest when I know they are representing me in the international climate regime and they're still not given enough of a voice. The Green Carpet Challenge is a, is a way of articulating something, of articulating change and system change and I think that's now what we're doing even though you know it may seem a little bit more remote. We still work with the fashion designers as well and people like Tom Ford for example I've gone on to to start, you know, the Plastic Innovation Fund. Yeah. So it 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 really has led to a lot of conversations and a lot of collaborations. It sounds like it spurred on so many positive so many initiatives. Things. So many things. But you know, if you came to me and said, "So, what is everyone wearing this year on the <laughs> catwalk and yeah. uh, on the runway or the the, the um, red carpet?" I I wouldn't be able to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas years ago, I could have gone, well, they're wearing this, 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 and this. Um, because it's got a life force of its own. And also my energy is much more like 
back to to my roots in a sense like I've just come back from Colombia from the rainforest and I'm interested in what's happening there well you know we we've talked about industry leaders and fashion designers and now this younger generation I'm curious what's the single most important way that the average folk that we can personally make a difference when it comes to our own habits when it comes to consuming fashion because I know that so many people just feel very overwhelmed. They think they can't make a difference, that the problem is too big. Mm. Well, the problem is bigger than it should be. So they're right about that. And it's bigger than it should be because their political leadership have failed to grasp the challenge. So the thing that you can do is you can tackle that. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, good, because it is overwhelming and it's really bad. And there are a lot of solutions. There's solutions. There's there's even a political pathway worked out, which is the International Climate Agreement. You know, we know the job. We have to stick well below two degrees to mitigate the amount of warming. You know, even we had a disastrous ocean report that came out last week, which showed that we are locked into a certain amount of sea level rise. I know sea level and surface temperature is very contested, but the science is there. You can read about it in Nature magazine. Um, if you don't believe me, and it's good to do your own research, by the way. So the the point is that we're in very serious territory and everyone should be waking up each day and asking, what's happened overnight? Yeah. You know how when you're really interested in a story, something is big, you're like, what's happened while I've been asleep? Mm-hmm. You should be doing that every morning with climate and nature. What's happened? What's happened? What's come on stream? What what big renewables offshore wind has come on stream? What solar projects have come on stream during the night? Like give yourself hope. There's lots of hope around. But also get cross and allow yourself to get yeah. cross when things haven't happened, when they failed. And in terms of what you can do as be, a, being a consumer, don't be a consumer. Don't cons- do not let yourself have that label for even one second. Say I'm a citizen with agency. Sometimes I need to consume, and you know, if I'm in a privileged position, I am able to consume. But even that's getting harder, and people are finding, you know, cost of living crisis, climate change, and the effects of, of um, extreme weather and disruptive weather, as you well know, um, put up the prices of crops. And basic living becomes harder and harder and harder. So you, you can you can say with some indignation, why on earth is it so hard for me to be a consumer? This is ridiculous. Right. You know, this is ridiculous. And also be a more demanding consumer because you want you want goods that have not raped and pillaged the planet or put massive people at a massive disadvantage. And you you know why with all the know-how that we have. All the supply chain so-called efficiency, all of the things like blockchain that companies are always telling us that they've got such a handle on, or at least they tell that to their investors. Why are we not seeing stuff that's traceable? Why are we not having more opportunity to own or even lease, swap? Why, why are things not there? Why is it so hard for me to repair something? Well, I'd love to see clothing labeled. And I'd like to see what people are getting paid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's no reason why you can't you can't have that those kind of details. Like you see the ingredients on a food package. Yeah, yeah. And there's been many campaigns to do that. Um, and the the actual fiber composition is seriously important as well because you know if you do think of yourself as a consumer, a lot of the time you're being shortchanged because you know there, there's evidence, very recent evidence that shows that people are buying stuff, believing it's wool or silk or or cotton even or natural fibers, and it's not. Mm. Um, you know, it's synthetic blends. And that that means you've got um something that's going to go into landfill or incineration or be dumped somewhere else, you know. So we're not even getting what we think we're getting. Exactly. And you're buying into something that you don't believe in. So Um, it doesn't sit with your values. Mm -hmm. So you can be vocal about that. I mean, there are things that you can do as a very sort of basic thing. Like I years ago came up with a 30 wares sort of hashtag that, you know, if you are thinking of buying something because that process is very accelerated, just look at it, whether it's online, in store and say, am I actually going to wear this 30 times or more. Right. And that's just that's just a basic. It needs to be 300 really. But if you if you can't answer that there and then you you can't have it. It's not for you. You don't need it. 
I think a lot of people justify that if I'm not going to wear it 30 times, then I'll donate it and somebody else will, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And as we know, there's a there's a lot of issues. You know, again, I would direct people to look at changing markets reports. Um, there's one recently on take back trickery where they looked at what the life cycle of clothing that had been donated or um taken back for recycling with major brands. They simply fitted air tags to into so sew them into the clothing. Someone's mum did that. So thank you to her. And then they traced them all around the world. They've just been dumped in Mali and places where they didn't have any waste infrastructure, you know. So this is a real issue, especially mm-hmm. when we know that it's plastic or fossil fuel fashion. Right. And <laughs> try saying that. But but um you know the these are very, very sharp problems because if you're in fashion, you're also in waste these days. Yeah. There is a whole argument that says, okay, say fast fashion, this is your system. And if this is your system and this is your pollution, first of all, you need to disclose how much oil you're actually using. And secondly, you need to disclose how much waste you're creating. And then you need to invest in solutions. And I don't mean giving some money to a charity to do it on your behalf. I mean, actually invest in solutions. And, you know, incineration plants and waste infrastructure, it costs billions. Mm-hmm. So could they even afford to do that? If if we had actual polluter pays legislation in any of these jurisdictions, could right. they afford to do what they do? Right. And that is always the issue with disclosure because at the back of the minds, and we go back to the people who are driving this system, they know they probably don't have the funding to pay for the way that they're operating. So something will have to change. I believe that there will be one big fashion brand that will do it. They will right. flip. They will change. And it, they will be the leaders. Once one goes, and I mean like proper like system change, once one goes and says, we're going to do it because the cost of inaction or pretend action is just too great. So once one goes, that, that will be game over for the ones who don't follow. Mm-hmm. So as citizens with agency, what do you think we should be demanding from our leaders to affect the biggest positive impact on climate? Well, I think there's some really interesting stuff that's happened in other industries. So the car industry, for example, was for many years pretending that it was it was reaching 1.5 uh, trajectory. Mm-hmm. And everyone's like messaging, oh, we're on 1.5, we sponsor this, we'll do this, we'll do this. <laughs> the bravado. And then some, yeah, the bravado. And then someone within the car industry went, really? I'm going to have a look at this. <laughs> oh, it turns out you're really not. And that takes a very, very spirited, courageous brand. But there is yes. one that, at least one that's done that. And I think the same needs to happen in fashion. I think like rather than signing up to all this sort of fiction, these pacts and all of this, which are all very over-engineered, it needs someone to say, guys, you are not on course for 1.5. You must be crazy so we also have this thing in the in the uk now where we have we've had a lot of issues with um water quality and private water companies not funding remediation and all of this it has been awful so people people are told they can't go and bathe in the sea during the summer holidays and there's like a sign up going do not go in and it's like is this right i'm sorry are we not supposed to be campaigning for drinkable rivers never mind just being able to look at them what a concept ending up in hospital yeah i mean come on so our ambition is like fallen 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 so keep your ambition really high Mm -hmm. and i think it's really worth talking to other activists and looking in other spaces even if you don't consider yourself an activist because you think sometimes you think oh yeah i'm 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 campaigning for less sewage in my in my local river Mm, nice and i'm like is this my amazing life I'm campaigning for a bit less doo-doo in the river. Or should I be going? The bar is very low. Yeah, yeah. I want this to be drinkable. I, you know, so, and what I found is that there is amazing groups of retired or semi-retired people in the UK who've got some skills. So there was a guy I was reading about the other day who was like a surveyor. And he, or, and he's good with data. And he basically just sat down with all the numbers for like poultry farms 
who also like a big polluter of rivers. And then he sat down with the government statistics and he compared them. And he's, they're finding the mismatches. And then you know what they're doing? They're phoning up a legal firm and they're going, oh, could you represent me in court? There's crazy intelligent people who know how to use software and who know how to mobilize. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I did last year, which you might say has got nothing to do with the fashion and textiles and sustainable fashion, I started a community climate and nature weekend with some friends. I actually did it two years ago. Last year was the second year. And I only introduced fashion in the second one. Um, and we had a fashion swap. And it was amazing. And what happened was a lot of retired people live in this area. They're, all of their younger kids came back who all moved to the city and all came back for this fashion swap. And it was just really, really like amazingly invigorating with lots of contacts and if you can get things in people's diaries they all start facing towards something and they start to plan so we also do a tech take back and we have people coming from all over the place this is a bit overwhelming with all of their tech so it's about looking at the gaps in people's understanding the conversations that they're not really having with people Mm -hmm. and it's about connecting not necessarily laying it all out for them on a plate but it's about really like giving them the opportunity to engage with some of the issues which is a little bit deeper than just saying buy this because it's slightly less bad than that one right which is fundamentally boring and will actually only hold people's attention for about one minute Mm -hmm. every community every society gives gifts you know it's a kind of it's a thing you know and every society has some form of consuming and giving and reciprocity and a lot of the time it it's designed it's not just altruistic you know you're trying to get get some kind of rapport with someone you might need them to do something for you you know it's a way we build social structures right so these are very important and i don't think we always have to make them nicey nice but i think that we should try and take the pressure off people so they don't feel like everything has to be new. All of these things I feel like now we can really start to do, whereas before it it felt like you were preaching to people who may not be receptive. I suppose that's my message is you can more and more have these conversations now and you can find common ground because Loads of other people have done such brilliant kind of initiatives. And, you know, some of the apps are really useful as well. So there's apps for waste food. don't know if there's one for waste textiles. We have one in the UK called Sojo, which is where you find all your tailors and your sewing groups and people who will upcycle and all the rest of it. And it's really revolutionary, particularly because some people are quite socially introverted. They don't want to have a go out and start a conversation in the middle of the street about upcycling or whatever. It's not their thing. It's not their thing. And I think that in the past, it's fine for sort of a big mouth like me. (laughs) You do have to understand that not all campaigners and activists are extroverts, but a lot of campaigning and activism was set up for extroverts. Right. There are quiet changers behind the scenes. There are so many quiet changers, yeah. and they're usually the more powerful people, to mm-hmm. be completely honest. Strong silence, right? Exactly. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us today, Lucy. Your work is an inspiration and necessary. If you would like to learn more about Lucy Siegel, you can follow her on Instagram at, at the Siegel, on X at, at Lucy Siegel, or find her books on Amazon. Thanks so much, Lucy. Thank you. I think we can all learn a lot from the likes of Lucy. It really is an industry unlike any other. Samuel Heim for GQ commented during the fashion shows of 2022, the audience expects more than a bunch of models stalking down a catwalk. They expect a performance. Oh, definitely. I actually happened upon the Balenciaga show Mm -hmm. during Paris Fashion Week and just the arrival of the guests and what they were wearing (laughs) was something to behold. I bet. Once Louis Vuitton created a fantasy world at the Louvre with dramatic yellow roads and even special touches such as a Florida marching band, and American rapper Kendrick Lamar. Mm. And at the Casablanca show, four horses were corralled on a runway as a special feature. Wow, that's a spectacle. Like my days working at Medieval Times. But good thing the horses were corralled because about 90 seconds after the first model started to walk the runway, the horses started to do what horses do. Poop. Yep. 
Yeah, heels and horse poop is not a happy combination. Well, if they were unhappy, they didn't show it. They were professionals. If you thought a few horses was a bit over the top, Gucci once paraded 68 sets of identical twins. Wow, seriously? Yes, designer Alessandro Michel decided on the idea as an homage to his mother and her sister. He said, I am the son of two mothers, Mom Eralda and Mom Juliana, two extraordinary women who made their twinship the ultimate seal of their existence. They lived in the same body. They dressed and combed their hair the same way. They were magically mirrored. One multiplied the other. That was my world, perfectly double and doubled. Wow, that's quite dramatic. <laughs> and isn't that what fashion shows are all about? It's the drama. Seems so. I read an article by Farah Andrews who explained that galleries, museums, and warehouses have been the typical locations to host a fashion show, at least in New York City. But in 2019, there was a trend towards unusual locations like a tennis court, a courthouse, and in the case of Tom Ford, an abandoned subway station. Well, that's a bit different, but even New York City and Paris seem humdrum compared to the show presented by Kim Jones, the men's designer for Dior, which took place in front of the Pyramids of Giza. William Van Meter for Artnet News said, it was a fashion show 4,500 years in the making. That location certainly makes a statement, like art often intends to. Mm -hmm, true. But sometimes historically, those fashion statements could affect the way you live. Okay. Well, a perfect example would be the hobble skirt. A hobble skirt? I've never heard of that before. Well, it was a skirt created in the early part of the 20th century, which was attributed to French designer Paul Poiret. The shape of the skirt was long and sleek. They came quite close to the legs, especially at the hem, therefore restricting a woman's stride, causing a woman to take really tiny steps. That would drive me <laughs> nuts. What if you had to run for the bus? Right? Yeah. I know if I wore this skirt and tripped, I'd be like a turtle on his back getting up. <laughs> it would be near impossible. That's hilarious, Walker. I would help you up as long as I wasn't wearing a hobble skirt too. <laughs> well, some fashion trends could actually even be more obviously detrimental to the health. Take the corset. The corset has really early roots. Some people say it goes back to Minoan culture in 1600 BCE, but then it was worn on the outside with the breasts exposed. So not really the same thing. No. The corset as we know it was in use from the 16th to the 20th century in the West. There have been many variations of the corset over time, including the materials they were made of, which could include layered fabric, whalebone, wood, and later steel stays. From what I gather, in the 18th century, the corset allowed for accentuating the breasts, of course, improving posture and flattening the midriff. Now, I did read that properly fitted corsets worn in the 1700s were not as restrictive that we might think, but they did allow women to work without restricting their breathing. Well, that's helpful. Right. But it was a bit tricky bending over, though. That was a problem. Well, I guess in those days, if you drop something, you would just wait for a man to pick it up for you. I guess so, unless a man you were depending on was also wearing a corset, which apparently some men did. No way. Mm -hmm. Man, so no one is picking up anything ever. <laughs> right. According to Vogue France, some doctors have attributed respiratory diseases, deformity to the ribs, damage to internal organs, birth defects, and miscarriages to the wearing of corsets. But surprisingly, others supported the use of what they called moderate or health corsets. Really? Why on earth would they support them at all? Well, for body support. I guess it kept your back straight. Okay, so keeping upright. Mm-hmm. Who knew? Susan Isaac for the Royal College of Surgeons of England said that the good or the bad of a corset may have come down to how tightly they were laced. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. She says women were often laced so tightly their breathing was restricted, leading to faintness. Compressing the abdominal organs could cause poor digestion, and over time, the back muscles could atrophy. In fact, long-term tight lacing led to the rib cage becoming deformed. That sounds like a total nightmare. That's right. Yeah. How did these trends start? I mean, binding the torso, binding the feet, torture, right? I know. Well, the small feet were a sign of beauty. And so mm. the binding was an effort to keep up with that standard. Mm. Men's fashion trends over time don't seem nearly as uncomfortable or unhealthy, though. Yeah. Aside from a tight necktie, <laughs> I think they've got off pretty easy. Those hammer pants in the 80s looked really comfy. Oh, yeah. Women certainly have suffered as a result of some pretty horrid fashion trends. Yeah. It's no surprise that loosely fit flapper dresses, A-lines, and shift dresses would be welcomed after eras of corset wearing and hoop skirts. 
Of course, it was the 60s that really offered a freedom which had not yet been experienced. Right. Aside from some stratospheric platform shoes of that time, fashion seems to have become a lot less dangerous and more pain-free for women. Definitely. I actually just came across a brand in the UK worn by some royals and celebrities uh, called Soul Bliss. Hmm. And they sell super comfy footwear of all kinds, including heels. And I'm desperate for a pair. Oh, I want a pair. Mm-hmm. But of course, indulging in fashion can still be painful for the bank account. Oh, so true. So do you have a fashion trend that you took part in that you wish you hadn't? Not really. I did love my velour tops and corduroy pants, though, in the 70s. What about you? Uh, well, when I was about seven or eight, my best friend and I took the bus to the mall and we bought matching bright blue satin newsboy caps. Whoa, so mm-hmm. nazzy. I actually had a blue satin jacket with white stripes on the sleeves. Ooh, cool. We could have matched. Yeah. My best friend and I thought that we had our finger on the pulse of fashion. Maybe we did. I think you <laughs> did, Walker. So is there a fashion trend that you actually miss? Do you wish satin was still in? Uh, no, I kind of miss the big hair, the 80s. I know it's super cringy, but it was fun. It was quite a production to get that hair just the right height, you know? Mm -hmm. All the hairspray and the teasing involved. That's right. A whole lot of final net. Remember that hair? I do. (laughs) But as the saying goes, big hair, don't care. You got that right. I'm actually okay with my hair just the height it is today, but I think I wouldn't mind seeing a boho revival. Not your acid wash or roadrunner jeans. Uh, For the record, let it be known that I have never owned or worn (laughs) acid wash jeans, Walker. But I can't say the same about Roadrunner jeans or Sergio Valente. Don't worry, you aren't alone on that one. Some fashion comes and goes, but some have some real staying power. Like the G-string. Now, there's a belief that the G-string was invented in 1939 when the New York City mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia, required the local exotic dancers to cover up during the World's Fair. Wow, that's still not a whole lot of coverage, Walker. Or sunglasses. More modern versions have roots in chic driving goggles at the turn of the 20th century, but became a go-to accessory popularized by Greta Garbo and Jackie Onassis. Oh, I love my sunnies. Maui Jim's. Top choice. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. But of course, one fashion piece that has had crazy staying power is the little black dress invented by the glamorous Coco Chanel. Mm-hmm. Now, I bet you have one or two of those in your closet, right, Harris? You know I do. They're a staple. We often talk about what is currently trending, but we don't often talk about the future of fashion, aside from sustainability and ethics, as we did with Lucy. So true. So get me up to date, Walker. Where is fashion going? Or are we circling back again to past trends? Well, some of us even hang on to our clothes for the time when they come back into fashion. But it never tends to be exactly the same, though, does it? No, there's always a new take. Wide-legged pants, skinny ties, platform shoes. They might come back into fashion, but trotting out the oldies that you have in your closet, they always seem to be a little off the mark. Right. But if you can alter them to make them more modern, good for you. Mm -hmm. The classics usually stay stylish, but any clothes that were trendy way back when just look weird to me now. Yeah, me too. There are some really far out futuristic fashion trends in development though. Listen to this. According to Erica Serino for Scientific American, some clothing are now being made with live organisms such as living bacteria, algae, yeast, animal cells, or fungi, creating pieces of biodegradable textiles. These can be dyed with insect shells or plant-based colors. That's super cool. I hope ethical, of course. So what's involved? Well, apparently algae-based yarn is made in a three-step process. In an interview with Scientific American, Theanne Giros, Associate Professor in the Math and Science Department at the Fashion Institute of Technology, also known as FIT, in New York City, states first, a sugar called alginate is derived from kelp, a multicellular algae seaweed, and powdered. Next, the alginate powder is turned into a water-based gel, to which plant-based color such as carrot juice is added. Finally, the gel is extruded into long strands of fiber that could be woven into fabric. So this biodegradable fabric could lower levels of pollution and waste in our landfills. You got it is a huge improvement over clothing which are made of recycled plastic bottles, though innovative in its own right. How do you mean? Well, currently recycled plastic clothing is being made by plastics that are broken up, melted, and spun. 
according to environmental scientist Linda Greer. The problem with this process is that when we are done with the clothing, it's thrown away and the original plastic bottle doesn't get fully recycled. Oh, okay. Yeah, there are even more benefits to the laboratory-grown fibers. Apparently, algae-based fibers are naturally fire-resistant. Oh, that's incredible. Good for kitties' PJs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read that one of the big benefits of these fibers is that they might reduce the need for toxic flame retardants on clothes. Also, unlike cotton, the algae-produced fibers don't require fields to grow or pesticide use either. Mm. You can learn more about this revolutionary work by checking out the company Algenit online. It's not just the fabric that's an issue, though, is it? Clothing production, and specifically the chemicals used in the process of dyeing fabrics, is a real health issue for garment workers and their local environments. Wastewater that flows into water sources where the factories are located contains somewhere around 3,500 human-made chemicals. That's a lot. It is a lot, and it's frightening. Apparently, 10% of 2,400 chemicals in finished clothing may actually be dangerous for our health, which is very scary to think about. So when are these biodegradable clothes going to be available? Well, they're still quite costly to produce. The price would have to come down before they're a viable option for most folks. Mm. This is a really interesting field to study, though. The faster we can get these fabrics into the hands of consumers, the better. Well, and there's some other really cool initiatives too, Walker. Designer Ryan Jason is creating clothing which grows at the same time as the wearer. No way. Yeah. He's creating what is called adaptive clothing, which are lightweight pleated, and the pieces can grow up to seven sizes bigger. They're also fully recyclable, and it's said that his clothing is origami-inspired. That could have saved me a lot of money as kids are growing up. No <laughs> kidding, right? A lot of designers are also experimenting with different natural materials, such as orange peels, pineapple leaves, and seeds. So why not use these kinds of materials, which might otherwise go to waste, but rather we can create fashion with them? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So would you wear clothing, which offers a natural scent that changes depending on your mood or the time of day? Oh, for sure. Though I wonder what smell it produces when you're cranky and stuck in traffic. Mm, nothing good, <laughs> I would imagine, but maybe it would be good for those people who are really scent sensitive because it's more natural. Oh, so true. Now, have you heard of skin feeding clothes? No, and I don't think I want to. <laughs> It's not gross, I promise. In fact, this clothing has the ability to release vitamins and minerals into the wearer's skin. Okay, I don't know about this one. This seems a little too <laughs> sci-fi. Or what about a cardigan with sensors that help with your posture? Smart clothes in the future might, through a direct line connection with your doctor or assistive medical data software, send paramedics to your door long before you start having stroke symptoms or other health crises. Wow, that's pretty cool. Like smartphones are no longer just for phone calls, smart clothes will no longer be just for wearing. While technology is obviously deeply involved in the future of fashion, not just in how clothing is designed and made, but how it's marketed as well. Yeah. AR, augmented reality experiences, are interactive experiences that combine reality and computer-generated content. And this will also be involved in fashion sales in the future. Hmm. For example, say you're interested in outfit, but aren't sure how it will look on you. You can use your phone watch AR models, perhaps even a model of yourself, move around wearing the clothes. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. And this is just what we know about. In the words of the very famous Don Draper, the future is something you haven't even thought of yet. Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your host, Harrison Walker. If you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate it if you would rate and review our show. It helps us grow and expand our reach. Subscribe to follow us each week as we continue the conversation. You can also say hi to us on Instagram at at Harrison Walker. We would love to hear from you. 